Today we will be in 1 John 2, 1 John chapter 2, and verses 12 through 14. I was going to do a larger passage, but again, I'm like, this is, the, this paragraph and the next paragraph has a lot in it. And I just felt like I, I think it would be important to pause on these verses instead of taking um, the larger passage. And I noticed a lot of other pastors did the same thing. I'm like, okay, I think there's wisdom in this. You know, I have to challenge you today. Are you growing in maturity? Are you still growing in spiritual maturity? Are you growing up in the con to the conformity of Christ? The goal of your salvation is that you would be conformed to the image of Christ. That is the end game of Romans 8, 29, 28, 29. And that's where we sh we're supposed to be. You know, I don't know about your house, but I remember my mom having a little mark on the wall for how tall I got. Did any of you maybe have that as a kid or do that for your own kids where you checked each year, maybe on their birthday or maybe you did it more often you know, like, man, this kid's growing a lot. And you start you tra tracking it. You had this growth chart to check how fast these kids were growing, how much they've grown between years. Today, I want to challenge us as we come into this passage to grow spiritually. And I borrow from David Jeremiah a list of scriptures that he shared. That the Bible actually gives us several challenges to be growing spiritually. We can't just expect that we're mature. That would be a false assumption. We need to be realizing that we need to be active in growing to be more like Christ. The theme of increasing spiritual maturity is found in 2 Thessalonians 1.3. Your faith grows exceedingly. Paul said there in Ephesians 4.15, that you may grow up in all things into him, into Christ. 1 Peter 2.2, 2, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. 2 Peter 3.18, grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Hebrews 6.1, let us press on to maturity as rendered in the NASB. The Bible is clear. He wants you and I to grow up before we grow old. That's a really good, and that's from David Jeremiah. I borrow that from him. But too many of us are remaining babes through our life. And do you remember in Corinthians where he challenges those at Corinth? Hey, by now you should be eating steak, Christian. You should not be on a bottle sucking only on milk. You need more substance to your diet. You and I need to be ones that are saying, I need the word of God in my life. I need to grow. You cannot grow without the word of God. Can I say this very strongly? Caleb will not replace the Bible for spiritual growth. Nothing in this world can replace the authoritative word of God. Can I say that a going only to Sunday, though that is, an, is a very important, biblical, essential part to your discipleship, and without it, you cannot grow. But the only coming Sunday for your feasting of the Word of God without you doing it on a daily basis is not enough. You will stagnate. I know Christians who have known Jesus as their Savior for 50, 60 years, but they haven't grown for 30. That's a bad state of affairs. And you and I need to be ones, God, please help me to grow more this week than I was before. My grandmother used to challenge us, you should learn something new every day. I should say my great-grandmother. I believe John is addressing three stages of maturity. And good men disagree on this, and I'll, I'll just in a nutshell. Throughout the book of John, you have seen him use the term little children. And uh, he is going to use that throughout the book. But I believe, regardless if you believe, he's in general saying to all little children, or whether he's speaking to those who are only babes in Christ, you come up with some of the very same base point, that you're all forgiven. That is the common denominator, the least, uh, you know, just reduced down to the bare minimum. Everyone who knows Jesus as Savior is forgiven. 
And that's who he addresses as little children. So regardless of your view, practically, you still have three stages of maturity here in this passage. That's my unhumble, ridiculous opinion. You can disagree with it, and there's no problem there. So just study that out. But I am going to present it as three stages of maturity. Little children in the faith. Young, strong men in the faith and victorious spiritual fathers. That will be how I'm presenting this passage as we go through this. Um, and let's look. And the disagreements only is, if, is it little children as in just babes in Christ? Or is it for all believers? You come to the same thing. So I don't think it really, uh, the interpretation, the difference there makes much of a difference. But I want you to dig in. Verse 12. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the wicked one. Let's pray. Lord, would you please help us to see the different characteristics of spiritual maturity? And Father, would you challenge each and every one of us, Lord, to grow, to yearn, to be with you, to know you. I thank you, Lord, for your grace and ask for your help and guidance in this. In Jesus we pray. Amen. In our passage, I want us to ask the question... This way, what does God expect of believers on their growth chart? And what is essential to Christian growth? You know many of those answers. My main challenge today will be uh, this. And for some reason, I am not responding. Okay, so... With this, I will, you'll just uh, get to follow along. One, as we go through this, as God's children, all born-again believers are to be known for their fellowship. That is your first blank, to be known for their fellowship. And A, why is the Christian forgiven? Well, let's look in. Verse 12. I have written to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Here, we see that why is the Christian forgiven? Because of his namesake. It's about Jesus. It's about him. We need to believe more that life is about his glory than our own. <clears throat> David Allen said this, he is writing because your sins are forgiven. Uh, the Greek, literally, your sins have been forgiven. He uses the perfect tense to convey this idea. Your sins have been once and for all forgiven and will never be brought up before God again. Isn't that good? They're done. It is completely once for all and forward. The perfect tense is used here in the Greek text. And we're reminded that the forgiveness of the sins is one thing all Christians, true born-again believers, have in common with one another. So, God wants you to have assurance of salvation that you are His. How do you have assurance of salvation? Remember back in chapter 1, verse 7? Chapter 1, verse 7, it says this. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. You and I are completely and totally forgiven. Nanny, you could take it to subpoint A, 1A, if you would. As we look through this, at this subpoint A, for his name's sake, is, what does it mean? We know often you're told to pray in what? In Jesus' name. What does that mean? And in accordance to his will and his character. So, when we pray, we do not want to be in conflict with God's character. We want to align with it. And here, we're told, you have fellowship with him because God is concerned for his name, his character, his reputation. And he comes here forgiven on the basis of who he is and what he has done. What has Jesus done for you? He gave all. He sacrificed his life and his life's blood. 
And he died a death that only the Son of God could take on for you by taking on humanity. And what does he do? He cleans the slate for you. You're cleansed because of the blood of Jesus Christ. The slate is clean and remains clean because Jesus died in your place. You know, he's done this for my name's sake, he says, for his name's sake. Do you notice that it doesn't say your sins are forgiven for your sake? Isn't that how we think in our me first thoughts? I'm forgiven because Jesus loves me. Yes, he does love you. But he forgives you for his name's sake. What's the difference? Your salvation is about God. You see, this whole book is going to bring up the word know and known 35 times. This book is consumed. He wants you to know him. Do you remember a few weeks ago I mentioned, have you ever had as a father or a mom, a little girl or a little boy that comes up to you and you ask him, what are you up to? And they said, and they tug your hand, I just want to be with you, dad. The book of 1 John is saying, I want you to know that you need to be with me. Just tugging on the hand of God, if you would, and knowing him. God wants you to have an ever-increasing knowledge of who he is. Do you remember that beautiful prayer in Ephesians chapter 1 where Paul says that I pray for you basically for an ever-increasing knowledge of Jesus Christ? that you want to pray for something for other people and you're like, I don't know what to pray. Pray that they would grow in their knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's a biblical prayer to be offering up before the Lord. So as mentioned, and David Allen brings this up, my sins are not forgiven for my sake. They're not forgiven for anything I have done or deserved, but because of what Christ has done and earned for me. I did not earn my forgiveness. Jesus earned everything I need. It's totally on his merit, nothing that I have merited. My contrition, my repentance, my faith could never earn me forgiveness. Jesus said it was finished. Jesus was the one that offers forgiveness. It's totally on him. Now, faith, repentance, turning to him, are the means of me receiving this great benefit of forgiveness, but I could never, ever earn forgiveness. It's totally based on Jesus. B, what is a baby Christian struggle? What is our struggle? Immaturity. That's what babies struggle with. You know, normal babies, they, they are supposed to develop and grow. And what does it take for babies to develop? Food. And as they get bigger, lots of food. No, I didn't say that. Um, they, they eat all the time, don't they? If they have a healthy diet and they're able to take it in. You ever see those horrible pictures from Africa with kids? <clears throat> they're emaciated. That are just, their, their tummy is all bloated and their arms are nothing but sticks. And you look and you're like, oh, how could someone ever be so starved? You've seen pictures of things like that. Stunted growth, the lack of proper nutrition. Babies don't eat steak, though, unless it's pureed for them. We need to remember where children are at. What's interesting, so look in your chapter 13. Sorry, 13. Verse 13, chapter 2, verse 13. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who was from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. C. So if I was to divide this verse up into three sections, C would be 13C. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. So throughout the book, he's been addressing children, my little children, as technon. That, that's the Greek word. But he doesn't use the same word here. He uses the word pedia, which... This is like really immature bottle babies, okay? They're totally dependent. I'll never forget, growing up on the farm, would have some bottle calves. And sometimes you would have a calf that was a little premature, something, the calf was small or it had problems, and you would sit there 
and I couldn't even use a normal size nipple because the, the calf was drowning. And so I had to use a smaller one, which means patience, lessons and patience for John, which is always a good lesson that I need. And so I'd have this bottle there and it would be a long time. And I, I don't know how many times I had to pull the bottle away, hold the, the calf's throat up or put it down because the calf was choking. Because even though it was just such a small amount of milk, that calf was not mature enough to swallow and to handle what I was giving that calf. And you know what the, what, as John is coming in here, I write to you bottle baby Christians. You have one thing in common. You're all born again. You're little born ones. You are, you're forgiven ones. That's what you have in common. It's equal at the foot of the cross. We all came the same way. And little kids need instruction. They need a direction. They need, they're vulnerable. They need some boundaries so they know where danger is and what to avoid, what not to touch. They start out gullible and they're easily led astray. And here, he says, I've written unto you little children. Because there's something else here. Because you have known the Father. Now this is beautiful. Let's go on and uh, see. Our subpoint C. What privilege does the Christian know? They know God is their Father. This is incredible. He's like, my hope is totally in a person. You see, you cannot have a strong relationship with God without knowing God. Knowing Him as holy, loving, good, just, merciful. You need to know God like no other. We need to grow in a vibrant relationship with Him. You know, the problem with babies is, you know, do they care what they put in their mouth? I remember Christmas caroling. We'll protect the guilty. But I remember one day I'm in one of the nursing homes in Sergeant Bluff and one of the little baby boys that came along who, who could just barely walk, he picks up something off of the floor in the nursing home and I'm like, no, <laughs> it's too late. Um, so I got to wipe you out and I say, here, dad, you might want that. Dad was trying to play it low, so mom didn't know how bad what just happened. But, you know, it was, it's gross, it's already happened, there's nothing really you can do about this. But I'm like, hey, you want to wipe up like that? Maybe, I don't know. But um, with babies, they're willing to put anything in their mouth. They're concerned most about filling their tummy and, and the diaper that's no longer comfortable. And one of the things that we have to be mindful of is, you know what? As Christians, we can't stay on milk because we're no different than a baby who doesn't like our circumstances. We don't call it a dirty diaper. We call it relationship issues or work or something. Problems with HR, whatever it happens to be. Or it's things like we, uh, we aren't taking in the stake of God's word. We read maybe our daily bread a few times a week, but we aren't really in the Bible. We're not memorizing it, not thinking on it, not trying to apply it, not trying to change, not trying to grow in our knowledge of Jesus Christ. And uh, that's one of the things we need to be careful of. You know, we have a special privilege and... Uh, with this next one, I want us to consider this. Uh, I have a verse, a couple of verses up here. John 1, 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the power, the right, the authority to become children of God to those who believe on his name. Here, God's like, I've made you my own children. And turn to our next one, Anna, if you could pull up Romans 8, 15 through 16. It pictures the fatherhood of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage, again, to fear, once you're saved, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The word Abba is, a, is an Aramaic word, and it... It's, it pictures that of daddy, of an intimate cry out of belonging. And father, God, you are my father. We have the spirit of adoption that has brought us completely into the family. 
You know what John says for everyone that knows Jesus, even if you're a baby, a bottle baby Christian? You all know you're forgiven. And you all know who God is and that he is your father. Those are essentials to baby Christianity, if you would. Well, go on. Our, our next point, number two. As we come into this, as God's children, too, you should advance in maturity as spiritual young men, full of spiritual strength. As I think of young men, this is would be young adult men up to about 40 is generally where this age, this, this word was used for. The strap of the, sh the strength of that age group. You know, I, I talk with some men and they hit about a little over 40 and they're like, concrete's not for me anymore. <laughs> you know, it, it's starting to get a little too heavy. I'm not keeping up with it. The back's not agreeing with it. But this is that young guy in his late 20s, early 30s that, man, he's using the jackhammer. He is moving the concrete. He has been toughened by adversity. And here, I want us to look in your Bibles. Notice in verse 12, actually verse 13. Notice in the middle of that verse, B, 13B, I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. This, this is very important. One of the things that's striking is sometimes we downplay the, the existence of spiritual warfare. Do you know what the young man has? He has, not only is he full of spiritual strength, but A, one of the things, he has a track record of spiritual victories in spiritual warfare. He comes and he has overcome the wicked one. He has a track record of being in the fight, if you would. We can't live in ignorance and say, it doesn't exist. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of wickedness in high places, the Bible says. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, 2 Corinthians 10 tells me. We realize that there is a spiritual war out there. And I can tell you some weeks it's really rough. You could, too, you know where all of a sudden evil abounds. The accuser of the brethren has been throwing the wiles of the devil. The arrows have been flying trying to take Christians out. Trying to take unbelievers out. Catching as many people in sin as would be lured into his devices. As we come into this we realize that these young men are ones who have overcome the wicked one. They have, they have been victorious in this. Uh, they have overcome adds a new dimension. Uh, Glenn Barker says this, the victory obviously was gained through Christ's death and now his followers have the task under his leadership to establish his reign over the world and the devil. Verse 14, notice, he says, I have written, notice in the middle of the verse, so 14b, second, I have written, I have written to you young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. Do you remember what Jesus had to pray in the garden for his disciples? Deliver them from what? From evil. We should pray, God, put a hedge of protection about us. Why do we pray that? Because we pray in dependence upon God. What do we have to rehearse in our mind? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. When you're starting to feel run down, beat up, tormented, struggling, we have to pray those things. We have to think about what type of warfare that we are engaged in. The world is this present evil... See, that's... I moved on a little too far. With... With all that's going, we're going to see another aspect of that warfare bore out as we get closer uh, to chapter 5, or verse 15 and following. One of the issues that we have to be alert to is that we are very temptable. We need to know where to go when we're tempted. We've got to go to God first. We need to go sometimes to the body of Christ where we can pray, would you please pray for me? 
if we're really serious about victory, we're really serious about getting the victory. Amen. One of the struggles is we're so proud. We can never advance into being a young man, strong, strapping, strong in the faith because we're not humble enough to ask for help. We're not humble enough to grow in mentorship one with another. And we've got to say, hey, this is a real battle. This is a real struggle. Can you pray for me. Have you thought of this? The, the fellow believer says, as iron sharpens iron, your brother is able to share some things with you. And most of all, you need the sword of the Spirit. You need the Word of God. The seasoned saint, has a, is, what's characteristic of them is maturity. And we're going to see that as we go into the fathers. But let's, let's go on to our next point, B. What do they have? Notice verse, chapter 14, verse C, section C. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you. They're strong. They have spiritual vigor. They, are, they have strength. This isn't physical strength. He's using the picture of young men who are strong. But he's saying this because these men, they depend upon God. They're real. They're men of faith. I'll never forget years ago, Joan, uh, I remember years ago, said of another Christian man, you know what, this is going back 40 years ago, your faith really encouraged me as a young man and I saw you sold out for God. And I'm like, that's cool. That she can remember that 30, 40 years later and that she shared that with that uh, one of our members in our church just saying, hey, your faith was really important. It really challenged me. Sometimes it's those godly young men that are able to speak into some things. I'll never forget a time when Mike Borink shared his, most of you don't even know Mike, but Mike, he was very much in the world, no evangelical witness in his life, unsaved, uninterested, totally uninterested angrily uninterested in God. His wife gets saved and uh, people just keep on witnessing and by God's grace, he trusted Christ shortly thereafter in the same year. But uh, he was working with Gerald Wacker over at the hydraulics plant and swearing like a sailor before he was saved. And you know what, Gerald? Like, you know, I, I would like to ask of you not to use my Savior's name like that. Not to use God's name like that. He didn't give him a long lecture. I mean, if those of you that know Gerald, it wasn't a long lecture. It was short to the point. But it was done in love and grace. And it just kind of stuck with Mike. And it was just a seed. Along to realize, hey, I am actually a sinner. But things like that started once he was saved. It's like, wow, this is, this is serious business. I'll never forget Mike sharing after he got saved. He started witnessing to everybody he could. And he took all of his, um, he, had, he listened to all the world's music. He's like, this isn't Christ honoring at all. And he took all of his records and he burned them in, the, in a barrel and got rid of it. He's like, I'm, I'm about following Jesus. I'm not going after this anymore. And he, he, he's like, my faith, I'm going to live sold out for Jesus. That young man in the faith, strong young men who are like, I am going to be full of faith and vigor for my Savior. How many times are we challenged to be diligent, to be zealous for the faith? Doesn't that come up in Jude and Timothy? We're challenged to be zealous for him. Young men in the faith, getting to that stage of maturity means you're zealous for Jesus. Are you zealous for Jesus? Are, are you digressing back toward the adolescent's toddler years? Maturity doesn't just happen, as you know. Well, C. Let's see. The, our last point is uh, subpoint for two is what do they have as an abiding interest? Did you catch this? In 14, the end of it, and it says... Because you're strong and the word of God abides in you. The word abides means to remain in you. 
It, it has, it's, it's a strong residence in you. It kind of reminds me of Colossians 3.16. Let the word of God dwell in you, what? Richly. In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your hearts to the Lord. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. We need to get the word into us. The world is constantly flushing out the impact of the word of God. We live in a culture where if I pulled my phone out, the average American um, youth is five to seven hours a day on a device. That's a lot of time. And they may spend five to 15 minutes with Jesus. Who do you think's influencing them the most? Okay, let's all be honest. How much time do we spend on sports or the news or YouTube or you name or Facebook or Skype or even Snapchat that you wouldn't even be able to track it? How much of, the, of your time is used up in all kinds of media? But how much media have you had with Jesus? The one who invites you into, to know him, to love him, to, to really have this strong, real, vibrant relationship with him. You know, wouldn't it be tragic to go through life and say, ah, I know babies don't all grow, and I'm okay with that. What kind of babies don't grow? It's so sad. I, I hate to utter these words, but... Babies who are stunted. You know, Tara was a premature baby, came in at two pounds, and she couldn't understand why she was so much smaller than her brother, six foot four. And you know, you, you probably don't. Tara grew up raising hogs, so I mean, so just you got to understand farm humor. But her mom said, "Well, have you ever seen the runts of the litter? They never quite turn out quite the same as the rest." Of the, and she didn't mean anything bad about that, but in farm understanding we all got it we're like yeah that, that makes sense with we don't want to be ones who are spiritual runts though when we have the ability to grow we have the ability to know him to realize the full extent of how good he is you know can you imagine so you're 30 years in jesus 40 years old in the faith 50 years old in the faith 60 years old in the faith but you're a stunted immature developmentally disabled christian for 30 40 50 years that's not healthy it's not good to be a baby christian your whole life well you should know if you know the Lord and you're a young man in the faith or you're a father in the faith, how many themes of the Bible could you tell me? Could you tell me the theme of Matthew right now? Could you tell me the theme of Revelation? Could you tell me the, the theme in 1 John? Could you tell me a theme in two, three books of the Bible? Any books of the Bible? Could you tell someone if they said, where do you go? I'm worrying all the time. Could you tell Matthew 6? Could you tell them some psalms that are treasured here in your heart? If you can't, you are not even a young man in the faith. You are a baby. That would be a tragedy to be in that place. We need, can you share the Romans road? I couldn't at one time. And I remember I was going to graduate. And it dawned on me all my friends were not, they didn't know the Lord at that time. Praise God, a lot of my classmates have trusted Christ as Savior. But when I graduated, only one other knew Jesus as Savior. And as I started realizing it a little late, but when the Lord got a hold of me, not his fault, but my own, I was just living ignorantly. I remember I said to my youth pastor at my home church, Pastor Joe, how? How do you, uh, how do you share the gospel? Do we have this baccalaureate survey could you tell me how i can tell others about jesus because i i don't know how to tell someone how to get saved and he's like oh i'd love to so the following service so i think that was a wednesday by sunday he had the romans road for me he had it all written out and so i for years i kept that romans road in my bible and because i wanted to be able to tell others how you can know jesus as your savior but all of a sudden, I'm like, I need this. And I memorized it so I could share it with people. Because 
I'm like, I want to tell others that they would know. One of the things as we're getting into this next section, we're going to be challenged on what a spiritual father is. I got to ask you this question. What do fathers, what are they able to do? A father is able to reproduce himself in a sense, confront and illustrate. Those are three markers, characteristics of a father. And I'm going to challenge you today. Are you a spiritual father? Are you, have, could you lead anybody to Christ? Have you witnessed to anybody truly inviting them to trust Christ as their Savior, that they would be rescued from an eternity away from God, separated from a God who loves them intently and did everything he could to pay their death penalty? Could you share that message? There was a time when I realized I couldn't do it and I started reading gospel tracts because I'm like, I've got to figure this out. Are you doing any independent studies to find out how to tell people how to know Jesus as their Savior? If not, there's a track rack on the back. Help yourself to it. Every week, if you'd like. Take two, take three. Get to know how to share the good news with Jesus. Spiritual fathers reproduce the faith by telling others, you've got to know this. Men like Gary Rising, who's now with the Lord, but who would share tracks with everybody, restaurants, men like Mike Borink, who would say, you know what? I pay my bills snail mail. Why do you do that, Mike? Because I get to give a gospel track with every bill. I'm like, that's a great idea. And because he challenged me on that, compliments of Good News Baptist Church, when I send in rebate forms and everything else for the church, slap a gospel track, because Mike was right. We can share Jesus with as many people as we possibly can. You know what's sad? Most of the time, a lot of folks have never seen a gospel track. Here's another thing. Have you ever had a Christian witness to you? Why not? Because there's that few spiritual fathers out there who are trying to reproduce their faith. We got to stand up. We've got to be, we're in a fight. We're in, if you would, a spiritual battle to silence you. The world doesn't want it. Satan doesn't want it. But you have the, you are an ambassador of peace. Is peace a bad thing? No, it's the hope of eternity. It's the message of life. It's the left message of rescue, eternal rescue. Why are we keeping it to ourselves? Message of confrontation. I'll bring that up in just a moment. But let's, uh, let's look at our, our third point here. With point three, as God's children, you should advance in maturity as spiritual fathers. Being distinctively faithful, having a known walk with God. Notice the first phrase, 13a. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you because you've known him. This is a real, vibrant relationship. I want to read something that Donald Burdick uh, shared in his commentary on how that... He is one who is to be known. He is one that knows the Father and doesn't just uh, live for himself, but lives consumed with wanting to know God in a real relationship, a vibrant relationship. I want to uh, go on. We see not only that you have known him who is from the beginning, we see that this is the eternal God. He has an unwavering years and decades of faithfulness. He loves God. He points people to God. He points other Christians he's like, you need to trust God more. And this is what helped me years ago. This is what's... He's not flaking on Jesus. We live in a, a time where Christians are flaking on God all the time. Flaking on God isn't maturity. It's regression. It's a lack of maturity. It's not being where we need to be. Next, let's consider this. B. Who are they true to? They know God is the real, historic, unchanging God of the ages. He's noticed, he, you have known him who is from the beginning. And 
John loves bringing this up. In the beginning, he's, he started the book out. Jesus is the same gospel and the same Jesus as the one who was in the beginning. And it takes you back to John 1.1 1, 1 and Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. This is the original truth. He's like, God is unchanging. Uh, let's bring up a couple of these passages. Uh, Psalm 90, verse 1 and 2. O Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth. Or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Here, the psalmist says, I want to give a testimony. God has been God forever. He is always reliable. He is always true. Let's go to our next passage there. And we see this, Malachi 3, 6. For I am the Lord, I'm Yahweh, I do not change. Therefore, therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. We could look in Hebrews, probably 11, I'm trying to remember, chapter 13, maybe 6. I, only, I might have to uh, investigate a little bit on that one. But how that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. He's always with you. He's always true. And we rest in God and saying, <laughs> I, oh, here it is. Chapter 13, verse 5 of Hebrews. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We can hold on to a God who does not change. He is reliable. Spiritual fathers are always encouraging. Ladies, you godly ladies that tell others, don't lose heart. Don't give up. Trust the Lord. This is what helped me in the dark time. That's a spiritual father as far as a stage of maturity. You are being like those godly women of Titus 2 and pointing, love your husbands and things of that nature. When all those tests, be a good keeper at home. Love your children. Keep the right focuses. Don't let all the drama of this world distract you. Those are messages that stronger Christians should be giving to one another. Not because your other brother is a baby. But even strong believers need reminders of this. This is not a, uh, like some kind of hierarchical thing. This is, this is just a growth chart. And every one of us are capable of and do sin. He already told us in chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, don't say that you haven't sinned and don't say that you don't have a sin nature because we all sin. But just make sure that you're growing respectively in the areas that you need to. Uh, go ahead with our next 2 Timothy 2.13. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. We're always pointing people to God so that they would know Hey, you need to be trusting in the historic, eternal God. And we, we trust the one, as 14 said, that you, because you have known him who is from the beginning. We're resting in God completely. Today, I've got some applications for you. And as you go into these, spiritual fathers are capable of reproducing their faith in others, witnessing, confronting, hey, are there times where you have to tell your kids, hey, don't touch the stove, it'll burn you. Don't do this because it will hurt you. Don't go in the road because you could get hit. Are those warnings that a father does that? A spiritual father says, beware of, you know what? You might not want to be on the internet without a filter. Isn't that what a spiritual father does? Have you ever tried this? I've, I've used coven eyes. You might want to consider that or something of that nature. There's there, a spiritual father comes along and says, hey, this is a real battle. You need to really think about this. Um, these are, he uses illustrations. I, I want to read this, Hebrews 13. He tells us, obey those who rule over you. And be submissive. Oh, this is 13, 17. For they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do with joy, not with grief, for that will be unprofitable for you. And, oh, verse 7. Remember those who rule over you? 
who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their faith. Don't you love it when you can say, boy, I could list off several of you men in this room that you have challenged me to be walking with the Lord closer, to be more careful about sin. Because of your faith, I have seen you be careful. I have heard your faith at different times. And it's like, man, that is so good. That's what I need to be doing. And one of the things that you and I need to be taking away here is how do I make sure that I'm giving an example that others could follow? Uh, go ahead, Anna, with our uh, applications. Beware of complacency. They're not there. Okay. Beware of complacency. You should be learning and applying your faith in God more and more every day. It is sin to think you have arrived, that you've learned it all. You've heard... I, I chuckle sometimes where I've heard a kid say, Oh, I've heard this Bible story before. I'm like, Oh, there's a lot more for you to learn. I, this, is my sec, this is my third time studying the book of 1 John, at least the third, and I learn more each time I go through a book. Because how do you exhaust an infinite God? I mean, isn't that kind of ludicrous for us to say, Oh, I, I know it all. I don't... Uh, no, that's just pompous. That's just lazy. Beware of those things. Um, we all sin. God does not want you, your defeats, to sabotage your Christian walk, Stephen Cole shared. Where do you tend to look for hope? Will reveal where you are, who you are serving. And my third application is true growth is not whether you are flattered for your Christian experience by others but in knowing God in depth, his word, which are the ultimate um, essentials to Christian growth. How can you have your mind saturated with the word of God so you have more victory over the wiles of the devil? With that, I'd like to challenge you and just be thinking of God, how can I grow to be more like the maturity that you would have me to be, which is growing as a young, strong man, which is a spiritual father with a track record of victory that can be exemplified, that can be shared, that can be illustrated to others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you and praise you for your great grace in which you have loved us, blessed us with, encouraged us with, Lord. I pray that you would help us to be found faithful to you, Help us to grow in faithfulness. Help us to grow in fervency. Lord, help us not to chicken out. Lord, help us not to be pushovers for Satan and for the temptations of this world. Help us, Lord, to be men of integrity, uh, men and women of faith. Lord, help us to be like the Hebrews' faith passage where their faith exemplified trust in you. Help us to exemplify trust in you. Not because it's our merit, or ability, but it's because of a love of knowing you and your word. Build us up in this most holy faith. Thank you that you've given us everything we need for life and godliness. In Jesus we pray. Amen.